and I'll begin with a homage to the triple gem, which usually just the speaker does. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sumha sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sumha sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sumha sambuddhasa Buddhang dhammang sangang namasami First, is this too loud, this speaker, or okay? Okay, the head shakes and thumbs up were all indicating good, good, all right. If you're joining us on YouTube, then feel free to get on Zoom. There should be a link in the YouTube description. And um, today I thought that we could begin with um, a paradigm that the Buddha sets out uh, called the hindrances. And there's a, a really beautiful sutta in the numerical discourses where the Buddha says, um, chitang pabasarang akandukehi kilesehi. Uh, the mind is radiant, the kileses, the defilements, are but visitors. And in Buddhist thought, the defilements are the three root uh, causes of our suffering. So there is uh, delusion, there is aversion, and there is greed. And there was uh, once a disciple who asked Longpur Cha, Ajahn Cha, um, he said, I see where aversion and greed are, but I, I can't find delusion. And Ajahn Cha famously answered that you're riding a horse and wondering where the horse is. And Ajahn Panyavado said that greed and aversion are the two arms of delusion. It's us pulling things close and pushing them away in hopes that we can uh, adjust the world to feed ourselves and find shelter in it. And yet this is the central uh, delusion is the idea that the world will ever um, completely fulfill our desires as such. Um, and the perhaps one of the most meaningful transitions in a life is uh, from an orientation of trying to feed off of the world, experience loved ones, to uh, an orientation of blessing and giving to this world, even in its uh, brokenness and imperfection, um, and understanding that in doing that, in looking at the world not as a source of lasting shelter, but rather as an experience, to, uh, an opportunity to learn and to give, we find a fulfillment which is genuine and a shelter which is real. But while these three root defilements of greed, hatred, and aversion, or in delusion, are useful to look at as the core tap roots of our suffering. The iterations or incarnations of them, the manifestations that the Buddha pointed to as most visible in our day-to-day -day lives were called the five hindrances. And these were what uh, he spoke about as the um, obstacles to a calm mind. So, uh, you know, in the Buddhist creation mythology, basically, there's these uh, Brahma gods, these um, beings of great radiance and breadth of mind and heart who uh, basically uh, become trapped and descend onto earth in this cosmology. And metaphorically, it's a useful uh, paradigm because what it means is that this taste of the free, liberated, and brilliant mind and heart is in some sense most natural to us. The defilements are visitors. And often one of the key steps 
in meditation, meditative practice and uh, spiritual path is simply understanding what it is that binds us to this constrained, narrow, and starved state of being. Because when we learn to identify and move past those hindrances, uh, then we inevitably let go into a broader and generous mind and heart. So the five hindrances to calm include kama chanda, which means sensual desire, sensual lust. And the Buddha uh, in one of the suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya compared this to being in debt. Um, the second is vayapada, aversion, which the Buddha compared to being ill. The third is sloth and torpor, tinamita, which the Buddha compared to being in a dungeon. The fourth is restlessness and remorse. This is a fun one to say, uttacha kukucha, which the Buddha compared to being enslaved. And the fifth is vichagicha, or doubt, which the Buddha compared to being in a caravan passing a thief-infested wilderness. So, don't know how many of those everyone has experiences with, probably um, most of us have been sick, um, but I don't think many of us have been in caravans. But the uh, five are really, really useful because most of our, much of our meditative experience is dominated by these. Ayananda Bodhi spoke about how for years her meditative practice of mindfulness of breathing was chiefly mindfulness of mind in the sense of getting to know these defilements and these hindrances. So someone asked Ajahn Chah if uh, when a state arises in the mind, when a thought or hindrance arises, do we have to investigate it or can we simply return back to our object? And uh, Ajahn Chah said, it's like you're living in a village. If someone comes down the street and you've seen them countless times before, it's okay just to nod and move on on your way. But in that village, if there is a uh, someone that keeps pulling you into the road or um, following you, uh, if a hindrance continues to pull you away from your supposed object, then the proper orientation is often to turn your eyes compassionately and fully onto that hindrance as your meditative, meditative object. Make that your meditation. And that doesn't mean you engage the person in conversation. It doesn't mean you follow the hindrance. But you let it be seen and understood. And that is a very fruitful path for a meditation. That is not a failed meditation. Some people say they can't meditate, but most of the preliminary years and subsequent years of our sitting practice often is simply getting to know our own particular flavor of neurosis. So that's fine. You know, we think often in the West of meditative practice as a development of technique, but what we're developing is our, it's a life skill development session in that uh, Buddhist conditionality speaks about the world as a swirling vortex of shifting conditions. And the, what this leads to is uh, a chaotic system. And one feature of a chaotic system is scale invariance, which means like a Mandelbrot set, a pattern repeating on a small scale will repeat through every subsequent level of scale. So this is the uh, some of the most profound insights that come at the beginning of practice come after you've driven yourself into a hole trying to follow the breath correctly and then berating yourself over not doing it enough and then trying to control it again or giving in to uh, kama chanda, sensual desire and just running off after you know the last chick flick you saw 
or um, uh, f- falling into aversion and uh, rehashing the same argument again and again. And then you realize that the pattern you're engaging with with your meditation is exactly the same pattern that rules your life. And you realize that how you're trying to control your breath is how you're trying to control your spouse or your child or your parent or your career. And how you're trying to escape from suffering in your sit is exactly how you're trying to distract yourself in your life. And that is not a pleasant meditative experience initially until you realize what's going on, but it is deeply valuable. So a meditation session that is spent getting to know that visitor of the kilesa, of the defilement, of the hindrance, is a good meditation. You can't be bad at meditating. You can only find yourself meditating on what your particular brokenness is. And that is fine. We're here to make allies or at least peace with the broken parts of ourselves. So one of the most powerful ways the Buddha spoke to approach each one of these hindrances was called the gratification triad, um, which sometimes he expanded to the gratification pentad, which specifically says that to let go of something, you need to see how it arises, how it passes, You need to see the attraction of it, the asada, and the disadvantage or the danger in it. And finally, you need to see the escape. And with many of the hindrances, this is useful because we can see the danger to some extent, for example, in anger. But often we don't look at the other aspects of that pentad or triad. We don't see why we are addicted to it. What is the attraction? So that's very useful to apply to each of these. Um, For example, with uh, anger, there's a particular uh, power and intoxication in the rush of anger, in the self-righteous feeling, in the crystallization of that solid sense of self. There's nothing more addictive than self-righteous anger, emotionally wise. Um, With doubt, there's something comforting about that dark closet we have felt and trapped ourselves in again and again. It's known, and it's somehow a bit more comforting than the wider vistas we might step into. Each of these hindrances has a draw, and to understand why we continue to go to them is essential before we learn to let them go. So the first of the hindrances, kamachanda, sensual desire, uh, the Buddha compared to being in debt. And this uh, is an apt metaphor because when we give our attention and our hearts to this uh, sensual realm or fantasy, and sensual desire isn't necessarily simply uh, pleasant tastes, smells, sights, experiences, There's nothing wrong with those in the world. Um, You know, Buddhists do not have to be, uh, you know, self-mortifying ascetics. Rather, it's our obsession with them and making more out of them than they are and tying our hearts to them. So this sense of being in debt is relevant because when we really buy into sensual desire. Um, I was just talking to someone this morning who works on VR in Facebook, and he was talking about how, you know, initially uh, these VR worlds are uh, quote-unquote mind-blowing, and that over time it just becomes the baseline, and there's nothing really novel about it at all. And this is why uh, chasing happiness in the form of sensual desire is drinking salt water, the Buddha compared it to drinking poison. And one interesting aspect of drinking poison is that uh, it makes you thirstier, is that the body wants to flush it out. So the more we drink, the more we want. And I think we all know that cycle of addiction that has trapped so many of those we love and often ourselves to some extent. So the way the Buddha spoke about getting out of this debt, this cycle of 
uh, you know, and trying to distract ourselves from one loss of uh, a sensual experience fading by jumping into a new sensual experience is like taking a new loan to pay off an old loan. The interest just keeps climbing. And so the Buddha spoke about moving past this in a few ways. Uh, one was to um, look at the three characteristics of experience, the impermanence, uh, the suffering, and the uh, not-self nature of these things, the fact that we can't control them, the fact that uh, they will change. And there's real use in that, um, in the sense of when we understand that this stuff is slipping out from our hands and that the pizza we've obsessed about for two hours will be gone in, you know, five minutes. We understand that the payoff isn't worth the attention we give these things. And it doesn't mean we still can't have the pizza. I know we have a picnic after this um, gathering, thanks to some generous folks. But it means that tying our hearts to those things and our attention and giving our time begins to feel, if not blatantly wounding, then at least trivial and fracturing. And, you know, uh, Aldous Huxley and Orso, uh, uh, who wrote 1984, Orwell? George Orwell often got in a debate because Huxley said, you have it all wrong, Orwell. It won't, the dissolution of society won't come from repression. It'll come from fracturing ourselves into distraction. And that is where we find ourselves, is the American tragedy is not loss through explicit tragedy always, although sometimes it is. And granted, I'm speaking from a place of quite a lot of privilege. But often where we find our suffering and our tragedy is through this loss of purpose and meaning in a fracturing of our spirits little by little, year by year. And this is where the path brings everything together. This is where we regain our uh, unification of spirit. Each of the hindrances is paired with one uh, samadhi factor, one quality of unification of mind. And the antidote to kamachanda, sensual desire, is ekagata, one-pointedness. So you can think of this in a meditative context. When the mind is still and calm, it becomes bright and happy. The body becomes still or strong through movement. The mind becomes strong through stillness. But in a life, it's the same. If we have purpose, even if we don't have jhana, even if our samadhi practice has a long way to go, even if we're broken in so many ways, if we have a spiritual transcendent purpose of truly trying to cleanse our hearts, um, with our whole beings and using every aspect of our lives in service of that goal, kamachanda, that fracturing of ourselves into experiences and feeding and thirst becomes less attractive, no matter how good VR is. And, you know, for me, I remember um, this really accumulating where in college I was living a fairly good life and trying to do good, but it always felt like every stream bed I found for my heart was always shallow enough it couldn't take all of my heart. And so there's no choice but then for the heart to fracture into a hundred tributaries down this way and that. The Dhamma was the only thing I've ever found that could take my whole heart, and that's correct. That is the missing piece in our society and our culture and our lives is what we know deep down is our is our purpose which is to achieve awakening and a complete selfless giving of of our lives and of our hearts what else would we be meant for and yet to have it said and felt and to be given a practical means of doing it is everything so this helps with kamachanda sensual lust this transition to giving, to purpose. And uh, that 
switch from feeding to giving, being an antidote, uh, works on a small scale. So I lived with a really lovely monk. I talk about him often. Kruba Adrian was his name, Panya. And he would, uh, whenever he got fixated on something, he would make himself give it away. So like often I'd be sitting out in the woods and he'd bring me like a big like cup of hot cocoa, which I, he wasn't going to bring me, but then he got obsessed with it and then had to bring me it instead. And it works. It's like once an object has a valence, a charge, it's very hard just to put it down, but you can reverse the charge quite easily. So instead of making, trying to make an object less attractive, just give it away. And the other thing is, at the heart, that desire to feed is an, a desire for connection. It's a desire to connect, but we, that arithmetic never works. We never can connect by feeding. We only connect and get love, ironically, by, by giving. And so learning to cultivate that sense of connection through, through gifts. This is dana giving. This is the first and grounded uh, paramita of the Buddhist path. Uh, spiritual perfection is giving. And often in the West, people love the concepts of sitting meditation, um, and they forget just to give, to learn to give, and find realms of your life where you can give and cultivate that. Um, in Sri Lanka, they have a practice I've spoken about a lot where before they eat, they make sure they give something to another person to eat. And once again, this can be hard for breakfast, but it is probably doable for dinner for most people. And I've had my parents take it on, and um, others in this community have taken it on, and there are story after story comes from it. The next hindrance the Buddha spoke about was uh, vayapada, anger, aversion. And when he talked about the metaphor here, he spoke about anger as a sickness where the person doesn't enjoy their food and there's no strength left in their body. Oh, and just to retreat briefly to Kamachanda, the Buddha had another metaphor for it, which was a bowl of water mixed with blue, yellow, and indigo dye so that you could not see your face. And sacred texts long known to you were not clear. Anger, which we spoke about last Saturday, the Buddha spoke about as anger with its honeyed tip and poisoned root. And the sense of sickness is good, a good metaphor, because with kamachanda, with sensual desire, we can waste a meditation thinking about that same movie or that same fantasy. And often that can be a good uh, recollection to bring up when you're looking at the drawback, is saying like, if this was a movie, would I pay to see it again? But with anger, it hurts. And the Buddha spoke about different personality types and where greed types, he said, uh, had a pleasant time at moving towards awakening, but were quite slow at it. It's the scenic route. Anger types had a very unpleasant time at it, but it was quite quick because anger hurts. Delusion types, it's slow and it hurts. So it's always a bummer. Luckily, most of us don't know if we're delusion type. That's the irony. So, And uh, just to take that brief tangent, uh, greed matures into faith in some Buddhist conceptions. Aversion matures into discernment or wisdom. And delusion matures into spaciousness or equanimity. So there is hope for us. And usually more like a nice little buffet of all three. But perhaps it's not worth going too much into anger, apart from saying that uh, looking at the draw of it is really useful. Because anger has a flavor and a savor to it. And it's a bit like chewing on that same bone again and again. And... Um, I don't know if I want to go into it as much as since we did yesterday or last Saturday, but the antidote being metta, 
And when we think about the antidote as metta, loving kindness, to remember that metta has four faces. And in the Buddhist cosmology, the Brahma gods, which are the in incarnation of metta or jhana states of deep concentration, have four faces in the imagery you see. So metta has four faces. You have uh, metta, loving kindness, friendliness, a, genu genual, a general sense of goodwill towards all beings. You have karuna, compassion, um, specifically uh, concern for suffering of another. And then you have mudita, uh, sympathetic joy, rejoicing. And then you have equanimity, upeka, equipoise. And often the difficulty with metta is we get so stuck on that first face of sort of a bright sense of friendliness. But very often, karuna, compassion, especially towards ourselves, is where is the face of metta we need to look at and use at that time. Because often there's a temptation to jump straight into uh, spreading and rejoicing in that bright, dazzling flavor of uh, externalized loving kindness, when what we truly need is to realize that we're hurting ourselves. And often there's a real need to stop and humbly listen to our own suffering with compassion, with karuna. And where the approach and cultivation of that warm glow of metta can often be a bright, uh, a bright and active initiation or catalyzing the root to karuna, compassion, often is much more narrow and intimate. You'll find that often the way you bring it up isn't so much bringing in all these beings, it's just thinking of one person, one situation, one bruise in your own heart, and just humbly resting with that. There's a back door to metta that most of us miss all the time, and that's through this humble, listening of compassion. And so often the part, place we have the most trouble finding that compassion is towards our pasts. And with most of our neuroses, with most of our what we call sankara programming, our personality, things we run, how we're the extrovert, we're the clown, we're the introvert, whatever our programming is, the ones and the uh, patterns we run that we so dislike in ourselves are almost always survival mechanisms that are from our past that help us survive. You know, perhaps you're the clown because as a child you were uh, one child among five and that was the only way you could get attention. So instead of pushing away from these old habits, these old patterns that dominate, can you welcome them in? Can you say thank you for saving me, for all you did? And, and I do think I have a better way now, so you're welcome to sit there and please have some tea. Um, we're in Seattle, so coffee's probably more appropriate, but uh, I, don't, I don't need you in the same way. And that's compassion. And this is a big, uh, this paradigm of holding these parts of ourselves as guests, as the hindrances as guests, and not pushing them away, not thinking they are unwelcome visitors in our meditation that we have to get rid of and evict before we can get down to business. But understanding that if one of these hindrances continues to come up and crop up, it's okay to make it the object, to welcome it in. Chittang pabasarang akandu kehi kile sehi. The mind is radiant, the defilements are visitors. But how do we receive visitors? you know, uh, with hospitality. You welcome them in. 
you listen to them, they can feel seen. And obviously, if they're just passing by the doorway, there's no reason to, you know, drag them in. But if one continues to come, maybe there's something that they need to say and that you need to learn. Because whatever it is that keeps coming into your meditation, it is coming into your life, and it is likely dominating and hurting you and others. So this is where you get to approach it in a calm and caring way. And if there's a certain visualization that helps you invite those pieces of yourself in, a golden room, a warm cabin, a field, then set up that space for them. But uh, in terms of attending to the part of yourself that is constantly wanting to go into debt, that is constantly becoming sick with anger, which the Buddha compared to a bowl of water bubbling with flame or uh, heated under, over flame until it's bubbling up. Um, this is how we make space for that and understand that it's very much part of our practice. There's another three, but I think we'll save those for next week. So uh, good luck, everyone, with this practice. Sadhu, 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 anumodami. So um, we have a time for some questions and, and discussions. And uh, because the mic is yelling at us, we'll just keep it here with me. But please say your question. and. Uh, a bit briefer is okay because I'll have to repeat it for the mic so that everyone can hear. If you're joining us via YouTube, you can type your question into chat. And if you're there on Zoom, raise your electronic hand and we can unmute you and you can actually say hello to everyone. We have you displayed on a big screen. So uh, not intimidatingly big, but it's you know big enough. So uh, whatever people would like to talk about, either from the talk or uh, from anything, then we can. So the question was, um, the talk uh, was interesting enough uh, to the questioner that they were hoping, you know, there was this uh, thinking of how do I have other people in my life hear this or, or understand and how do we put that down and just remain with the, with the talk itself. I have a compulsion to write stuff down all the time similarly and it, it gets kind of annoying to be honest when I just want to be there with people and listen. But um, I, you know, my, my feeling is um, I, I, for me, and I think most of us have, have had that ex this experience is when we come into contact with some of these teachings and the Buddha's wisdom and imagery and analogy are just, it's genius of another order. I've never encountered words and teachings like this. Um, I think there really is a draw to just to talk about it and rejoice in it, and that's beautiful. Um, and uh, you'll just have to see when the people in your life start to get annoyed, <laughs> you know, and and really acknowledge that the biggest, you know, there's a, a great power to just setting an example in that way. And you know, in the more refined circles of of Buddhism, um, sacred texts and pictures, you aren't. Uh, supposed to throw away. You burn them and then imagine the fire and smoke as uh, sacred words and metta spreading out. So I, I think there's something about visualizations like that where, you know, if, if it helps to sort of bring in these other people to your heart while you're listening, then, then do that. Imagine shrinking them and bringing them in to listen with you. Um, but that aspect of joy, I mean, that's beautiful and if you can cultivate that in a way that lets you be with the with the meditation and the talk that's lovely and visualizations can help with that bring them there here with you um yeah 
and then maybe there'll be someone you can talk to about your practice at some point too. Can people uh, remember the word for restlessness and remorse? I think it's a good one. The Pali, anyone? Utachakukucha. Say it together, all right. Utachakukucha, yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> means hovering over, and the pairing of those two terms is fascinating, restlessness and remorse. <laughs> and, then, and then two, um, you know, uh, I still feel like there's like an element in there that's missing from the meditative practice. And I, I just wanted to say the thoughts on it. Are just that yeah. So um, the question, if I can try to summarize, was uh, the questioner's practice uh, consists chiefly of uh, body scanning and moving through the body um, and then uh, when hindrances, but kind of keeping a feeler out for when hindrances arise strongly, and if they do, kind of acknowledging them, seeing them, getting the taste, um, and then that allows them to uh, disappear or fade again, and then returning to sort of this main object of the breath or the body. Um, and this seems to be a way of developing both samatha tranquility and vipassana insight into those defilements and other aspects of the mind. Is that about right? I love that uh, metaphor of tasting the hindrances. I think we want to develop the relationship of a connoisseur with our hindrances. So, you know, a connoisseur of wine, you don't just go around like, jug, like chugging the wine. You just take a, take a taste or sniff it, you know, and then put it down. Um, so I think that's a useful... Um, it's really meaningful that the hindrances have a place in that paradigm to be seen and relinquished as is appropriate and that you have the anchor of the main object of the body. Um, I really appreciate the paradigm of or the imagery of kind of sitting in a room and uh, the Buddha would say, or sorry, Ajahn Chah would say, you know, when these defilements come up to the door, uh, you can open the door and they, they open and they look in, but there's only one chair in the room and you're sitting in it. So they, they just have to stand there and then they leave. And the issue is if you get up out of the chair and then they can sit down and that's the problem. So this idea of staying in the center of the room in that chair, uh, as, as these hindrances sometimes come, but then also in that chair having that bird, uh, the Buddha compared the breath to a bird. And I really like that paradigm of having the sort of bird in your hands. Um, holding it not too tight, not too loose. But um, I think one thing that's important and lost often in the uh, West is that uh, it's not just that we're putting down um, the hindrances into a, neut a neutral anchor. 
Meditation is the, is the playful and engaged development of the skill of pleasure. And meditation needs to be pleasurable to work. So you'll notice with the counterpoints to the hindrances, the counterpoint to kamachanda, uh, sensual desire, is one-pointedness. The counterpoint to vayapada, anger, is uh, um, pity, uh, rapture. The counterpoint to um, uh, sloth and drowsiness is uh, directed thought. The counterpoint to restlessness is pleasure. And the counterpoint to doubt is uh, sustained thought and evaluation. So to really uh, move against these, you've got to replace them with something because your mind's feeding on the hindrances for a reason. It wants something. So it, it's agitated or it's reaching out. So that aspect of developing pleasure in the body, it's not simply enough to come back to that basis of the body and kind of anchor, but there has to be a playful and engaged and interested development of working with your main meditation object to bring about pleasure and rapture and brightness. Because when the mind has that, it won't be inclined to invite in all these guests because it's bored, you know? Um, and I think this is an issue because it's, in the West often meditation practice is taught as, you know, either come to a point at the nose or a mantra or even in certain really amazing meditative techniques um, it's more a continual scan of the body. But if you look at the main meditation object the Buddha taught, breath, um, it's a full-bodied conception of learning to use the breath energy as a energy throughout the body to, um, to basically bring up pleasure and refreshment and um, that sense. And for those who haven't looked into this, there's uh, uh, two lovely books on that back table called Keeping the Breath in Mind and with Each and Every Breath, which teach this whole bodied breath technique, which is where you're really imagining the breath flowing through the body and you begin to be able to um, bring up this sense of pleasure and uh, a real brightness of mind. Um, and if the somatic access point to pleasure is not readily available, because for many of us it isn't, um, although I really recommend cold showers and, uh, uh, well, cold showers and Qigong for that. But for those who that's not accessible to, metta, loving kindness, is a really direct and important access point to, to pleasure. And so when the mind's kind of just anchoring back where it was, I, I think what it misses is this aspect of brightening. And in the uh, third tetrad of the Mindfulness of Breathing Sutta, the Buddha speaks about how you move through mindfulness of mind, through developing the mind, and it's one becomes sensitive to the mind, one gladdens the mind, and then one concentrates the mind. So the mind has to be bright before it will be still. And um, so that's what I would say is like, the anchor point isn't necessarily just a neutral anchoring. It's a playful engagement trying to um, bring up pleasure. And uh, with AI, they found that, you know, if they just put in a certain program, uh, the AI was like, it would do all right for a while. And then, you know, if there's any anomaly in the situation, it would fail. But what worked with machine learning is having the AI play against itself. And that's what meditation is. The hindrances are, are they have all of our own intelligence behind them. You know, like we're playing against ourselves. So the hindrances are smart, so you have to be playful against them and think of new ways. And one of the only tool belts robust enough to really work against the hindrances effectively is the whole body and metta as well. So I don't know if that answered anything. And there um, has 
think sometimes um, I hope this doesn't sound too like too much like I'm claiming something because I'm not at all. Um, but where where I'll have like a lump of pain and I'll be able to like dissolve it into energy and then it's no longer pain. I can see that it's like little bits of energy that are made up of pain, but right. it's not painful because it's just kind of like dissolved and softened and mm. you know I can it, it's no longer this. No, it's a, it's a good question, I think, actually, or at least observation, is the questioner was saying that um, for them, a lot of the actual pleasure comes from a, a certain distance from the body, and, uh, you know, not that pleasure in the body is not welcome when it comes, but often there's a real brightness that comes from sort of letting go of that framework, and uh, that is especially pronounced when letting go of pain, you really see that brightness come, something like that. Yeah, and um, yeah, I think that's really legitimate. And I know you've worked with Goinka for quite a while, so you have a strong grounding in the body already. And I think this is why the Buddha, um, you know, gave us, at times he would list four elements, which are these aspects of the body, like earth, the solidity, uh, water, the cohesion, um, fire, the sort of warmth or cold, and then wind, the movement. Um, and with that initial kind of framing in the body, you really are becoming acquainted with those. But then sometimes he gives us six elements and he adds on space and consciousness. And I really find there's a, a point in meditation where the body feels constrictive and the mind is expanded and buoyed up. And if you try to keep it within that old framework, even without noticing, um, it can feel claustrophobic and just sort of dry. And I think there really is a point then to turn one's awareness to the elements of space and consciousness and let the mind expand out into that brightness. Um, and I think some characters also lean this way. Like Long Por Sumedho uses the sound of silence um, as his main object, and that's a subtle ringing below the auditory landscape. It's a really powerful object. Uh, many monks use it, I, I certainly do, alongside the breath but it's sort of the auditory equivalent of the perception of light. And it's very spacious and very much associated with these elements of space and consciousness. Similarly, when the mind becomes calm, often there will be this like brightening of the visual space, which is the light nimitta, the, the perception of light. And you can foreground that while keeping the breath in the background. And there can be a huge amount of pleasure and brightness that comes from that. So I, I think leaning into that is, is very valid. Um, and what I would just say is, in that bright space, keep aware, awareness out for um, how the breath still manifests in that field. Because even if it's not a bodily breath, often you will begin to detect like a subtle flow of energy often up the spine and down the front of the body or around that, that bubble. And um, that's helpful because just trying to kind of maintain a still vibrating awareness of high energy is really, it's not necessarily terribly pleasant over an hour. So often like that pity, that rapture can be seen to kind of flow along that as well. Um, yeah, and I, I know Miles My, has a, a, a van he built out, which we've labeled as all four noble truths for him. And, uh, you know, recently he got a little bike, which actually lets him like travel around and it strikes me that there is a place for that bike to kind of run around a little bit and maybe the body's the van and the bike is your, you know, so I think both are good, but you have, you have the anchoring in the van, so it's okay to bike around a, a, a bit if that's what's more fun. A weird metaphor. <laughs> All right, Jessica.
So the questioner was saying that um, the uh, phrase of being with your own flavor of brokenness resonated, but uh, she finds when she tries to open to that, a lot of anxiety comes up as well, and just wondering if anxiety fits into the hindrances and how to work with that arising. Is that something like it? That's there. That is that is a bro that is part of your brokenness. Yeah. Okay. And is there is it come with doubt or with fear or a bit of both? Yeah. With fear. You know, I think that restlessness and remorse have, uh, restlessness and remorse and doubt are all kind of mixed in there. Um, you know, and the metaphor the Buddha gave for doubt is traveling through this wilderness that's bandit infested. And that's a pretty anxiety provoking experience. And the metaphor he gave for restlessness is, um, you know, being enslaved, not able to do what you want, but beholden to another and constantly being on call to like, are you going to be here or there? And what will the future ask of you? And I'd have to think, I think more about that to give a, an answer. It's not coming or a, a, a thought that's relevant. Um, but I might say that um, it is really helpful to apply when you're receiving these visitors you need to have a good stable room to receive them in you know you can't just sort of be out in the woods like calling people over from the side of the freeway like may you know spend time creating that space in the room um you know anchor with the breath but then really make sure you're opening all the windows and letting in metta stability a framework of the body a loving kindness imagine yourself surrounded by those you love and, and then when you feel safe, yeah, invite, invite in the anxiety. Um, and, uh, and, and if it really begins to wash over you strongly, um, you know, anchoring in the midst of that uh, with the breath, often when things get calm, um, it, it's really important to find that careful point of, you know, concentration and really follow it, like just where the breath is on the nose or something. Um, but anchoring through that is helpful. And then to take refuge, you know, to take refuge and surrender. Because our brokenness is too much for, for us. It's why we have the refuges. And there is something deeply mysterious that runs through this whole world and this whole teaching. And the Buddha was so careful about articulating it to too much because people grasp. But the refuges of the Buddha, this quality of knowing and awakened awareness, the Dhamma, this like solidity of truth, and the Sangha, like what happens when that knowing Buddha knows truth, Dhamma, incarnate in a human being, and what that looks like, and, and the faith that that brings up in the love, like there's a lot of monks who couldn't think of Ajahn Shah without tears running down their, their face, and bring up that faith and that being held. Um, and then honestly, what I do is I, I surrender. That's the deepest wounds. I surrender a lot and say, like, let me give this to you. But I think the biggest thing is that the deepest suffering in our lives, we don't get to work with. We, we, we get to bow to it and let it wash over us and crack us open. You know, that's the first noble truth. And that's why there's that term noble, because it doesn't work to be like, well, this is part of my practice. I think I'll try to include it. It's like, no, you bow to it. And you, and you don't get to work on it. You, you get to let it crack you open. And that's where compassion's from. But it's a different paradigm. And you can literally bow to it if that's helpful. You know, 108 prostrations full length will, will do a lot. And I've, I've, I've done that before. I, when I was cleaning off a shrine, I accidentally knocked over a Guanyin statue and broke its head off. And <laughs> I did a lot of bows that night. <laughs> okay. Good luck. Okay, I think we're at the end of our time. I'm sorry if there were people on Zoom with questions. Um, yeah, apologies. Uh, so we 
usually will finish with a blessing braid. Um, does someone have the blessing braid? And this is just a way of dedicating our practice to someone or those who feel they need it. Sure. We have other names to bring to our hearts now. Monita. Monita's family who passed for years ago in a car accident. Janice Gates, Siri Porn, David Atkins. What's his name again? Devon Pickett. Diane Sherman. Uh, say that again. Kyle Felix. Larry and David. Okay. Um, let's finish the chant of loving kindness. Page twenty nine. Now let us chant the Buddha's words on loving kindness. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety May all beings be at ease, whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, May all beings be at ease. 
Let none deceive another, or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. So I know we're running a little over time. I'm sorry. Um, we usually we just move around and put people on the spot a little. If you've been here three times or less, if you wouldn't mind, it's okay if you're too shy, don't worry. But if you wouldn't mind, if you could just raise your hand and uh, introduce yourself and or say your name and how you heard about us. Jamie, Medaj and Kovilo. Great, welcome. Super porn, welcome. I'm guessing you heard us, of us through Siri porn and Juanita. Okay. And this is your third time, right? Uh, it's my second time being here. Okay, you get one more introduction. You're not off the hook yet. <laughs> Good. All right, great. Welcome, everyone. So, um, yeah, really just lovely to have everyone here. It's a wonderful community that's forming. Um, we have a few people, uh, specifically Ellen and John, who really work to bring coffee to us. So we have coffee. Um, we will continue to have coffee, but we also have it today. So please partake. Um, also, Juanita, uh, Siri Porn, EPU, and Malini, and many of the others brought um, a picnic. So uh, that might become somewhat standard. So feel free to bring some food after the fact if you want to hang around and eat and, and have a meal. Um, we, uh, in our tradition, the monastics don't touch money. Everything here is completely free. Um, please take as many books as you want. It's all free. Um, it's just a delight to have you all. If you want to tap into our other offerings, you can check out our gigantic sign in the back, um, which is kind of terrifying to roll up. So please take note, use two people to retract it. Um, we have a 5 a.m. meditation every day. We have a Wednesday Zoom and YouTube live stream that you can join. And um, we also have an Upasaka group for dedicated practitioners holding five precepts in a daily practice. Um, all that's there, and just scan the barcode if you want, or the QR code. Uh, one thing we're beginning to institute with the Upasakas, uh, the dedicated practitioners, as well as anyone else who wants, is encouraging a bi-weekly confession on the first and third Saturdays of every month with Basically, it's something the monastics do. There's a lot of wonderful psychological literature behind it, is find someone you trust and confess um, sort of uh, once every two weeks on the things you feel like you could have done better and rejoice in those you did well. And we have a formula for that and recording um, all on the Discord. So uh, if you join our Discord, you'll find that. And it's a beautiful practice, so feel free to pair up if you'd like, no pressure. Um, finally, uh, I won't be here for alms this next week, um, usually I'll be at Pike Place at 7 a.m. every weekday, so people are welcome to come and say hello. That won't be the case this next week. 
But I am going to go visit Temple, where Anagarika Jeremy, who many of you know, is an Anagarika a postulant. So there's two cards in the back, one to Bante Sudasa and Ayasoma, and one to Jeremy. If you want to write some loving words, please uh, feel free to do so there. That's a lot of announcements. Kim, is there anything I'm forgetting? I think we're okay. We have, yeah. yeah, we had some brave souls step up for Saturday, take, set up and take down. So. And finally, we just encourage when we begin the coffee social picnic, the first person you talk to, try to make it someone you haven't spoken to before or you haven't spoken to in the last three sessions, if you want. <laughs> Those who uh, wish to may bow to the triple gem. Uh, others don't have to.